Well, hello there, Davis and Rachel Carmen, coming to you on a great day with K-12 Alternative. We are the president and vice president and uh, owners of Apologia Educational Ministries. And we have a presentation for you today entitled COVID-19 Changes Everything About Education. And it's about time. So, Rachel, what do you want to tell the folks about uh, us as a family and our homeschooling world in a real quick bio kind of way? Okay, really quick bio. We have seven children, and in the beginning of our parenting journey, we were providentially introduced to some people who home educated, and I immediately knew that that was not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I was just like, I'm great, grateful that that works for you, not for me. I'm looking forward to getting my life back, putting my kids on a bus, and doing what I want to do. And then um, when our son started kindergarten, I was thrilled. And in very quick order, after 13 days in the circumstances, we don't have time to chase today. We ended up pulling him out and bringing him home. And it was the beginning of our journey. We will now this, this month actually start our 26th year of homeschooling. So We've been at this a long time. Um, we didn't think we wanted to do this. And this is was our providential moment was 26 years ago. And so we want to talk to you a little bit today about what it looks what it looked like for us, because we really do get if you've got that angst, that frustration, you didn't want to be here. Welcome, because we know exactly how that feels. Yeah, we actually had our COVID-19 moment 25, 26 years ago. Yeah. So we really do know what it's like to be in this mandatory trial run of homeschooling against your will, you're reluctant, yeah. and you're thinking to yourself, what in the world just happened? Right. This was not part of our plan. So we'll cover a lot of that as we go through. But first, I want to paint a picture for you. So imagine the following scene. Uh, you are coming up to a, an intersection of roads, and there has been a horrible uh, traffic accident. A school bus is laying on its side because a semi-truck just came and hit it on the broadside, and it is not a pretty picture. Well, the EMTs come, the police come, the ambulance come, and uh, fortunately, everybody's safe, but very shaken up. Uh, they get tested, they go to the hospital, they go home, and everybody can finally exhale and say, wow, that was a scary moment. Um, I'm glad everybody's okay, but what in the world just happened? So that's a hypothetical picture, but that's probably a lot of how a lot of you are feeling with what happened in March with COVID-19 and shelter at home and everybody coming home, suddenly getting to test drive homeschooling in that mandatory trial run of home education, school at home, whether you were in public or private, you were home. So that's the situation that happened. So how how is all that affecting education? So let's start with higher education. Rachel and I have seven kids. We like to say two on, boys on the front end, two boys on the back end, and three girls tucked safely in the middle. Our five oldest have graduated from our homeschool high school. Four have graduated from college, and we, our fifth is about to start their junior year. But even they get, had to come home and do online to finish out their college year. And a lot of colleges are in a strange place. Well, people predicted, and it's come true, that for higher education, there would be an immediate 15% reduction in enrollment this fall right now. And colleges are experiencing that and feeling that reality. There's even some that have predicted that 10 years from now, half of colleges will cease to exist. They'll go out of business. They don't have the endowment funds and the demographics are changing. The price tags are too high that there was already predictions of big change in the coming. Well, it's here. It's yeah. already here. Well, let's let's look at the K through 12 uh, education situation. What's happening now? We already had March, April, and May. We got, got a little bit of breather during the summer and now reality's coming back to face everybody and you got the CDC guidelines, you got governor mandates, you got school districts coming up with plans 
that let's face it, folk. Well, do you th- do you think they'll work? Rachel? Do they even have a just, chance of working? Well, I just I'm just concerned about the kids and the crossfire, right? I mean, I get that people want the schools open again, but I'm I am personally concerned about the psychological and emotional implications of kids being in a circumstance where everyone's masked and they're not supposed to touch anybody. I just think that those those are things that have been underestimated in my in my opinion. But I don't think they're actually workable for the kids, and I'm not sure that kids should be forced to do those things because it's completely against what we're made for. We're made for human touch and human community and fellowship. And so those, those guidelines really concern me. Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're really impractical. How are you going to get elementary age kids to social distance and not touch things and, and and then put their finger in their nose and their ears. And (laughs) it's, it's a disaster in the making. Listen to this quote by trends magazine, uh, about the situation. The numbers are clear. Many schools do little more than warehouse children, and they try to protect them from each other. Even in the best ones, too little time is devoted to critical thinking and too much to transport, structured activities, and state-defined indoctrinization. While the vested interest will continue to defend the status quo, this crisis for the first time exposes serious problems mm-hmm. with the antiquated model that is long past. Right. Now, a, a lot of folks, uh, one way that we've said it is that when you ask people what they think about public school, they often say, it's horrible, except for the one that my kids go to. Right. And uh, that's a little bit of what's happening here. Everybody right. defends the status quo uh, because it's what they're comfortable with. Well, COVID-19 disrupted all that. It was yeah. that accident scene that we talked about. And now everything's changing, even in the K through 12 world. So much so that earlier this year in the March, April timeframe, some surveys started happening, asking people, what were you planning to do this fall, this August, September timeframe? And the first report I saw said that 22% of the 57 million who were public or private schooling, they said they were gonna continue homeschooling this fall and joining the three, the measly 3% or 3 million that were already officially homeschooling. Well, I was actually skeptical of that. I didn't believe the 22% number, but then I saw more reports, mm-hmm. 41%, 60%, and then a very recent poll as reporting 80%. Mm-hmm. So you're at this event today right. because you're one of those percentages of the 57 million that were public and private education, you are saying, I want to do something different this fall because... Why? What are some of those reasons? Have have you articulated what are those reasons? So, Rachel, uh, we got started with a providential two by four of the head. Yeah, that we would uh, never have done. Folks today are starting with the same kind of COVID-19 may be the reason they're starting. Right. But why do you think people are deciding to continue that this fall? Well, I I think a lot of people are deciding to do it this fall because of fear, right? You can't get your mind around how it's going to work logistically to send your kids to school. You know, your kids as well as I know my kids, my kids in elementary school, were not going to be able to keep their hands out of everything and not touch their friends. And I would not have wanted my kids to be scolded for coming in contact with another human. That would have just been something I didn't want to do. Plus, it just seems, again, logistically, which days of the week are they supposed to go? Where are they going to sit? Everybody's going to wear a mask. I think fear is actually fueling a lot of the decisions not to home educate. But I also am betting that some of you did this in the spring, right? And in the spring, you brought the system home. So whether it was a public school model home with all their curriculum in there, guidelines and their assignments and all of that, or a private school thing, you brought it home and you're looking at it, you're going, Dadgum it, I can do this. And this is busy work and this is busy work. And this, wait, I, I can do this. I can do this better than this. Right. Um, and so you're saying, let's try this. Um, let's see what we can do. Let's cut what's completely unnecessary. Let's actually ask our kids what they're interested in. Let's Let's try this. And I'm betting, not all of you, but I'm betting that some of you have gotten a taste of the freedom that home education affords. And I think some of you have been able to see your kids blossom. I think some of you have probably been able to work through some issues in your heart, your own personal heart and your own homes. And you're starting to see what the possibilities of this are. And maybe for the first time you're going, okay, like, 
like I get it. I think that I might understand why all those people I've been making fun of, I might finally understand why they do this. And if you don't get any of that, I want to dare you to try to get that because I think that that is one of the most amazing things that home education affords is family. And I, I want to say here at the outset, when we first did this, I wasted valuable time being ticked off, just mad. I was just mad that the system failed me. I was mad that that teacher failed me. I was mad that I didn't get my life back. And guess who caught my anger? my kids. So I would really like to challenge you to take some time. I'm a huge advocate for journaling. Um, you know, be honest. If you're ticked, you're ticked, right? But dare to work through it in a journal, dare to get it out and dare to move past it. I do not believe that we have all been given what I believe to be a divine providential pause to be ticked off and to waste it. I really think you've got this moment and I don't, no matter what your circumstances are, right? Cause I've talked to working mothers who are trying to figure this out. I've talked to single mothers who are trying to figure this out. And I want to tell you, I think that we're better together. We can do this. We can figure this out. We can seek the Lord and we can actually be better on the other side of this. But I really want to encourage you ASAP, put it on the top of your list of things to do work through your anger because your kids don't deserve it, right? And hold hands and do this together and do it well. Well, and when we started 25 years ago, among many things, some of the, well, we only knew three people who homeschooled 25 years ago. Fair enough. But one of the things they told us that you may have even heard is that homeschooling is a lifestyle. Right. And before you were forced into this, you probably thought, oh yeah, whatever. Yeah. But now, what did you experience in March, April, and May? If you were like, most people across America, you probably took more walks in the neighborhood and saw your neighbors out walking, riding bikes, doing yard projects, enjoying being together as a family. Right. Because you were stuck together, right? I mean, what yeah. choice did you possibly have? And you may have thought, oh my goodness, if we spend that much time together, we're going to do this all the time. And ironically, you found out you actually enjoyed being together you because... You weren't wearing that old badge of honor, which was busyness, running here and there, frantic, 10 minutes late to everything, too much on your plate, everybody stressed and exhausted, not getting enough sleep. And right. suddenly you were getting enough sleep. You were eating meals together. You were enjoying time together as a family, having some conversations, not being rushed through things. Mm -hmm. And you enjoyed a quality of life that you thought was completely elusive completely right. impossible to get to. Right. And I want to just say, this can sound Pollyanna and perfect. It's not, right? It's a, it's a work in progress. Even 25 years in, we're still learning how to do this. And we're still working through issues in our own heart, in our own home, with our kids. Um, you know, we're a bunch, a bunch of sinners here, just like you are at your house. And so, this is what's possible. And there's an opportunity here to pursue something that we really believe is worthwhile. And that lifestyle is really coming around um, your family and what really matters in those relationships inside your family, mother and dad, kids, siblings, relationships with your children, conversations that you haven't had, needed to have, but you haven't had. So all of that, we want to paint a picture of what's possible, what you can pursue what you can you pitch a vision for your kids. So uh, now let's, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. Why are you possibly considering to, okay, I'm not going to have cold feet. I'm not going to chicken out. I'm, I'm actually going to do this right. this entire school year. Well, as Rachel said, there might be some uh, fear issues related to health concerns. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of teachers, 20% of teachers say they don't want to come back because of their own health risk and concerns. Well, that mm -hmm. makes it difficult for, to, to take care of all the kids. And, and then you got um, uh, some schools aren't even open. Uh, right. But then as we just started talking about, you may be remembering your positive experience this last spring saying, I want that again. Mm -hmm. I, I believe we can actually do it. Maybe you were even on the fence about homeschooling and you were kind of happy that you got to, to, to test drive it. this yeah. and it, it worked pretty good. And yeah. you, you, you and your spouse were just saying, yeah, let's let's give this a try. This actually was a lot better than we thought. And now we kind of understand that comment about 
homeschooling being a lifestyle. Right. So because it affects everything when you homeschool, it, really it affects how you do your whole day. It's not education at home. It's not like this something that you put in the morning until maybe a little after lunch. It literally influences everything you do. Planning a garden is now school, right? Going to the grocery store, comparing prices, estimating weight is now school. So, you know, the school in our, in our state, they require 180 days. And I'm here to tell you, we do 365, 24 <laughs> seven because it's that much of a lifestyle. So when you start literally thinking outside of the box, which is the institution of school, it really changes everything. Lee Coco said that, you know, this changes everything. This changes everything in the best possible way. So what are some other positives that you may or may not have experienced, that you may or may not be able to articulate yet? Well, Rachel and I want to give you a taste of just some of the positive things about ed educating your kids at home, uh, being together as a family, uh, directing the education of your kids. So we'll go through this uh, short list. Uh, first of all, it's the safest and healthiest place to be. To be. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Back in March, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, they apparently decided that schools were not a safe place to be. So they sent everybody to the safest place. And oh. where was that? Home. Oh. So, yeah. That's just a great irony in, in, in my mind. Um, school now... You, you can avoid the inefficiencies of all the lines you have to wait in and just burn time. And yet you can take advantage of all, this is, to me, this is one of the glories of homeschool and there's a whole list of them. But one of the things that I love is that you can linger and have conversations. Um, I, I literally did teach in the public system as a high school teacher for a little while. I don't think that that's required to be a homeschool mom. I really think it was a handicap for me when I first began. But when I was a classroom teacher, I was limited to the 43 minutes of class time. And sometimes students would have really good questions at the end of class. And I would say, can you hold that till tomorrow? And you know what I know, by tomorrow, the moment's passed. But when you're at home with your kids and they're asking these sometimes frivolous, trivial questions, just curiosity questions, you can chase those things with them. You can investigate how long can a bat fly before it has to land or how many flaps of a wing does a hummingbird have, or, I mean, whatever, right? You can investigate those things together and fan the flames of curiosity, but you can also be there to answer the questions of the heart. Like why are people mean or why, whatever, theological questions, doctrinal questions, and you can linger and actually have those conversations. We call those Deuteronomy six moments. Right. I mean, when you sit with your kids is one of the four times Deuteronomy six, when you rise up, when you lie down, when you sit and when you walk along the way. And so those conversations can linger. They can last more than 43 minutes. You're not waiting on a bell to say it's time to change discussions or change topics. You literally get to go with the flow of that's more natural in life. And that leads me to one of the others. If you had to describe the most natural learning habitat, learning location for kids, would you put them in front of a windowless in a windowless room with nothing to do but sit on a hard desk? No. I mean, a school room is really the most unnatural place to learn. But home is a great place where kids learn well before they ever go to school. It's where they discover things and go outside and collect bugs and flowers and look at God's creation and explore it all and really start learning in the most natural way. Well, and you mentioned safety earlier, and you were primarily talking about health safety, but emotional safety, right? Your, your kids are safe at home with you. You love them more than anybody else in the world. And so it's a place where their questions are safe, their insecurities are safe, their frustrations are safe. And so learning in a safe context is, is, is far more doable than it is when kids feel threatened as many kids do in a classroom circumstance. You may have been learning through this since March that one of your kids has been in crisis at school and they've just been going with it because they felt like they had to. So you may have learned some things about some maybe bullying or some intimidation or maybe some learning challenges that you were unaware that your child was struggling with and facing. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome that you've had this time to actually learn those things so that now together you can 
remedy those things and come together and make sure they feel safe and also help them learn. I believe kids come wired to learn. They come curious. Remember when they were little and what's that? What's that? Why? What's that? They were doing that because they were learning conversation and they were watching you, but they were also doing that because they were curious about the world around them. And at home, at home, you have the opportunity to fan those flames of curiosity and really, I think a primary goal that has been at least for us with our home education is the joy of learning. There's no reason for kids to hate learning. I get that they hate school. I get that because, you know, the bell is their overlord all day long. The whole hall issue, the whole bus issue, the having to take classes they're not interested in, all the classes they're not interested in, and the, and the teacher's just trying to test. I understand hating school, but man, not hating learning. And so when you're at home, you can really, you can do what needs to be done, right? But you can also change, uh, chase their hopes and their dreams and their interests. Well, and going to what Rachel said about those prolonged conversations, it's possible that you're deciding to continue homeschooling this fall because your kids said, I'd really like to. Mm -hmm. And if you pursued that, it, you might have discovered some things they were afraid of, the right. bullying perhaps and intimidation and things that were not just frustrating, but dangerous. Mm -hmm. And you've got to listen to what your kids are saying. And so if you've had those conversations and you've gotten a clue as to what was really going on behind the scenes, listen to your kids, listen right. to their hearts. Yeah. And there might be something else too. I've also heard parents say that their kids really want to be home educated because they're tired of wasting time themselves. They're like, I don't need to do, I mean, their kids are especially bright or they want to get ahead or they want, they want to get on with life. Right. I talked to a girl checking out groceries the other day and she was thrilled because she ended up working really hard since March and she's graduated a, a year early. And she goes, I wish I had known about this sooner because I want to get on with my life. I want to get on with my learning. And that's another option. So I, I know, I, I feel like so often, and I think you've said this, um, Montessori used to say every kid's a Montessori kid, but not every parent's a Montessori parent. I think broader, I think most kids are homeschool kids. They want to be with mom and dad. Look at kids who are you know, crying going into daycare or crying going into kindergarten. Want to they want to be with mom and dad. So I think it's more about us. And I, I'm going to tell you, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And I think it's worth doing, investing in your kids. And if your kids are asking to be home educated, if they're thrilled, do them a favor and assume the best. I've heard parents go, they just want to do this because they want to be in their pajamas all day. You know, okay, maybe one or two, but I think a lot of them want to do it because they get the opportunity. And I think that they see an, an opportunity. And if they're wanting to, man, you can really capitalize on that as you go forward in this journey. Quick side note on the pajamas. Rachel was telling me about some of the public schools that are requiring right. kids not to be in pajamas right. for their online classes. How I do you do just, that? The control freaks that are there. You know what? If you're homeschooling, you can have a pajama day if you want. It's your call. You're in charge. Right, right. So feel that freedom. So we touched on this one as well. When you're school at home, homeschool, home educate, you your kids will get the rest they needed. Mm. And just think of all the positives that come with that. It lowers their stress. It improves their ability to focus. Mm -hmm. It's literally healthy for them. But rest is something that... As Americans, we l used to wear that badge of honor, yeah. you d of busyness. Right. You don't have to wear that busyness badge of honor right. anymore. And it's not about being lazy at all. It's yeah. about being healthy. Right. And rest is one of those things that is so overlooked and yet so important for our bodies, for our minds, for our spirits. Test after test after test studies show that especially teenagers, you know, they want to sleep for a long time. It's because their mind is literally going through significant chemical changes. And that rest overnight is when their mind is actually able to file away and organize the learning that they've done through the day. And so just think of it this way. If your teen is not getting the rest that they need, and this applies to younger kids as well, but certainly to the teen, if they're, the teen, if they're not getting the rest they need, it's like your desk piled with files that you can't get off. And you're just, it's so hard to focus because you've got all of this stuff on your desk and you can't really get the next thing done. But 
you have an opportunity to make sure that your team gets the rest they need. And that doesn't mean sleeping till noon. It means a reasonable bedtime at night, a reasonable number of hours overnight, and then starting the day fresh and but rested. It makes all the difference in their ability to focus through the day. So let's talk about money. Here's one of the positives about homeschooling. We live in North Carolina and the average cost per student in North Carolina is 11,000 for, for public schools is $11,762. So by you keeping your kids home and homeschooling, you just save the taxpayers of your state 10 to 12,000 dollars per per kid per year. That is significant. In North Carolina, it totals well over a billion dollars saved. So I think that's a benefit. Yeah, I think that is too. <laughs> all right. What are some others? Hey, it lowers your carbon footprint. Think of all the time you're not in a car, sitting in lines, all the buildings. You, you think about a school building, it's actually just a redundancy. If everybody homeschooled, we wouldn't need all the buildings that burn air conditioning and heating and, and take up space. So there's a very interesting just I'll say carbon footprint issue related to that. I think another advantage of homeschooling too is you really do have an opportunity to get to know your kids at a level that you didn't when they were getting on the bus or riding in a carpool. It's really easy to relegate that component of their childhood, of their person to a building of quote professionals. But I really, that's one of the things that I think very few people understand about home education. They focus on the education part of it and even ignore the home part of it, the value of the home, but just the opportunity to really get to know your kids, what makes them tick, what are their securities, their insecurities, their strengths, their weaknesses, their dreams, their hopes, their frustrations, their woundings, all of that, really getting to know them. It's just such a prime opportunity. And don't we all want to be known? I know that that's something that I love about my relationship with God is he knows me and he loves me anyway. And our kids want that too. Our kids want to be known. And that's why we see so many kids making foolish choices on social media and even in, in relationships is they desperately want to be known. Well, mom and dad, you have the opportunity to get to know them. And this plays right into an individual education plan. Exactly. When you home educate, you can build into the curriculum their interest, and you can have a disproportionate amount of time built into that. So if you have a budding artist, you can do a lot of art classes. And then your other student who might be a budding mathematician can do more math courses. Right. The same if they're interested in computer science or music or you name it, mm -hmm. you can build in a disproportionate amount of time so that you can help uh, educate and train masters in their fields of interest. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts mm -hmm. about homeschooling is, and it ties into kids loving education because if you get to study what you're actually interested and good at, you're gonna spend more time at it, you're gonna get better at it. And then the world is really just a better place when we have masters uh, in certain fields rather than people who know a little bit about a lot and really nothing at all. Well, and I do want to say quickly before someone thinks that we um, only let our kids do what they want, that's not a fair conclusion. There are things that none of us want to do. As a mother of four sons, cleaning the toilet is not my favorite thing to do, but it is a necessary thing to do, and I can do it with a joyful heart. And so we do have things that our kids must do that are required that make them a whole person, but that still allows for a lot of time for them to pursue their hopes and their dreams, again, in a disproportionate way. And we do have the luxury of cutting out some things that are actually unnecessary. And those are th those are those things do exist in the public um, and even the private sector. So we do have our kids take reading, writing, and arithmetic, even if they don't like it, because those things are necessary for them to become who God's intended for them to be. But it still leaves a lot of time without the bus ride, without all the waiting in line, without all the riffraff that is unnecessary to their education that they can pursue their hopes and their dreams. Now, here's another really good positive about homeschooling. It still works when there's crisis. So a crisis doesn't disrupt your schooling quite like it would uh, a crisis would disrupt public or private. I mean, let's think about it. 
COVID-19 was a crisis that totally disrupted the public and private and college education scene. But we were homeschooling. The only thing it disrupted for us was uh, our, the sports seasons for our boys. Which was significant. Which was significant, but there was much less disruption. Other disruptions, if there's a health crisis, if you relocate and move, mm -hmm. those don't completely disrupt. No, because those are lifestyle process. issues. So it's if it when it's a lifestyle and something comes up, so like when we were younger and we were having all of those kids, right? Every time we had a baby, it wasn't an interruption or a disruption. We weren't getting behind. We were incorporating a new member of our family. And so it was just part of what we were doing. It wasn't a, a disruption. So um, we were unemployed for a period of time, for a long period of time, almost two years. And that also could have disrupted, but it was just part of where we were. And the Lord taught us a lot of things. We all learned more about each other during that time. And it was a lot because home education is a lifestyle and not just an educational choice. It just dovetailed into what we were doing at that time. And so you have that same opportunity. Uh, life disruptions and interruptions just become part of the flow. And really, that's more real life, is it not? Because as adults, you know, you get uh, rear-ended, right? Or you have a plumbing emergency at your house. You don't get to schedule those and you don't get to choose whether or not to have those. That's just the things of life. Somebody gets ill, someone dies, and you have to be present or participate or make decisions. That's just part of life. And so I believe when we educate our children at home, we home educate it part of our lifestyle and our kids see us just these things in the course of life. That's actually more real life than the institutionalization that, you know, sort of relegates those to someone else to go and do and don't interrupt this unless it's a true emergency. Your kids get to see you roll with life every day, right? Car repairs, everything. And so that's the other benefit. And, and those are typically, like Rachel said, unplanned events. But you're also in charge of the planned events. Yes. Now suddenly the daily schedule the weekly routine and the annual calendar is yours. Right. You get to decide when you go on vacation. Uh, you get to decide when to take breaks. You get to decide how it's all going to look. Right. And so some of the things we enjoyed about homeschooling is we would go on vacations to places when everybody was gone. Right. Because there are, everybody else is in school. We could coordinate our calendar to work better for us. Right. Uh, when we when I would go on business trips, we would take the whole family right. and make it an educational field trip. Time to, again to be together as a family, learn about traveling. Uh, I'm at some meetings, and Rachel's going to the zoo or to sites and other you know things in that city. So those are opportunities mm -hmm. that just don't exist when everything is compartmentalized right. and your kids are off at school. Dad's off at work, mom's off at work, and everybody's doing their own thing. And you end up with everybody even coming back to the house as individual islands in their own room with their own screens, and the relationships uh, are, are suffer. But with homeschooling, everybody's it changes everything, like Rachel said. It changes yeah. your marriage, your parenting, and the education of your kids, and everything does this. It meshes right. together as opposed to being compartmentalized and it becomes this beautiful thing where everything's related to each other. When my kids come into my office, my work might be interrupted, but now I'm helping with school or a discipline or character issue. I can go into the kitchen quickly and help and see what's going on you know, with food prep and the next meal and we can have meals together. So, so much of the daily, weekly and annual calendar is now yours to feel the freedom and make it work specifically for your family. And that means that you get to adopt and establish a rhythm for your day. Um, I would encourage you against doing specific time slots. Now, if the husband is working from home or the mom or both, you might be sort of stuck with some time slots for meetings, um, uh, regular meetings that you might need to have for your office. And I get that. But adopting a, a rhythm, a schedule for your day will help both you as the parents to see your windows of time to work, but it will also really help your children. So this is going to be a really specific um, thing I want to encourage you to do. 
sit down and work out your weekly schedule, uh, work out your daily rhythm, getting up, doing morning responsibilities, having family worship, having, I'm just doing a general idea, breakfast responsibilities, and then to school, to work. And look at it with your children. Your children need to know when they have you. Um, one of the big mistakes I think a lot of new people make in homeschooling is they just, you know, they want to give the kids the work to do and then they want to go do what they want to do, whether that is actual work or they want to go work on a project or they want to whatever. And they think the kids just need to figure it out on their own. No, they really do need you and your kids really want to be with you. And so if you really build in that time where you're going to be with your kids and I think earlier in the day possible that you can build into your children and then let them do some things on their own and just communicate with them. Look, I'm going to be with you here and work with you here. We're going to do some reading. We're going to review your math. And then mommy's got to go to a meeting from here to here. And then we're going to have lunch together. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to look at what you've done and we'll do some more reading. And then I've got to go to another meeting and you'll have something else to do. But communicating to your children, not assuming that they can just figure it out. Even if you're just going to take the school model home, right? And they're giving you worksheets and all these things that your kids are supposed to complete. Please help your children take advantage of this time and actually sit with them, rub them on the back, that physical assurance, that physical touch and help them feed into them and then communicate. Look, we're going to work. We're going to do this together. Well, you know, mommy and daddy work. And so we're going to have to figure out a way where daddy can get his work done and I can get my work done and you can get your work done and we can all work together. But it's going to be a process as you adopt a schedule, as you communicate it to your children, as you see whether or not it's working right, you're going to have to tweak it. It's going to be a process. But I really have seen in our own experience that kids love the idea of team. They can get it. They really can work with you. It's not going to be instant. It's not going to be the first time, but really this whole coming together is going to be a process and give yourself the space to know that it's going to be a process, but it is doable. Okay. So we've given you a nice long list of uh, additional positives that you may or may not have thought of. Uh, so let's get, kind of see where we're at. COVID-19 changed everything that remember that accident at the beginning. Uh, your educational game plan has been totally disrupted. You were forced into homeschooling earlier this year. Now you're considering and planning to do it this fall. Maybe you're scared, intimidated, a little reluctant, a little unsure. But why is this a good thing? Well, without this pandemic, the public and private education systems would have just continued like they were. And, and they were failing systems. Like I said, all, home, all public schools are bad except the one my kid goes to. Well, now the bureaucracy bureaucracy has been broken because it was never going to be fixed on its own. And now it's forced to experience some kind of change. Mm -hmm. They're starting with health kind of changes, which they would not have done without a pandemic. That doesn't address the academic issues. Mm -hmm. Again, like we've said, it'll really probably just make things worse. But what is the, what would you say is the sales pitch for public school to begin with? You know, if, if public school had to convince you to go their way, what would they say? They would probably say this. And they would probably say, um, we'll teach your kids so you don't, so have, you to. don't have to. Yeah. All right. The private school pitch is kind of similar. They would might say, we'll teach your kids better so you don't, so you don't have, have to. to. But it will cost tens of thousands of dollars per kid per year. Hmm, okay. So what might the homeschool sales pitch sound like? It might sound something like this. You can enjoy a vibrant relationship with your children while guarding their hearts, stimulating their minds, and protecting their bodies. That actually sounds pretty appealing. And yet, a year ago, you might have said, yeah, well, not worth the sacrifice. But today, you're thinking, hmm, I had a taste of that. Yeah, uh, th that that can be worth it. I, I experienced some positives but with that you know, idea in mind. So... Should, should you commit wholeheartedly or how should you address this first full year that you're facing? Well, I want to say when we first started, we really had a just this year uh, mentality. 
Um, I went, it was our oldest son. It was kindergarten. I had a secondary education degree and my whole mantra was surely I can't mess up kindergarten. I mean, a apple ash, surely I can do this. Surely we can count by ones, twos, fives, tens. Surely we can do a month. Surely we can look at weather. Surely we can do this, right? And I will admit, Davis will concur, it was not easy. It was rocky. Like I said earlier, I wasted precious time being angry, um, angry at him. I um, was sure it, initially that he was working his hardest to make me look bad, right? Because it is our oldest kid. It's our oldest kid because he was not ready to read. And I felt like reading was going to be the measure of whether or not this was being successful. And I felt like he was not cooperating, which is really unfair. That's not true. But that was my perspective at the time. And so um, we continued on and I figured out that tears do not have to accompany teaching your children at home. And so if that's what you've experienced, um, I want to set you free. Tears ought not accompany um, your teaching of your children at home, uh, either on your part or their part. Um, really aim for the heart before the head. And when tears come, there's probably something else going on and it's probably time to put it away and pick it up another day and talk about something far more important than whatever's on that page. But we fought it out and I dug my heels in and we were going to do this. And by the time the spring came, a miracle had happened. And like I was talking about earlier, this is not going to be instantly glorious, right? I mean, you're not going to wake up the day after you have your first day of homeschooling and go, wow, what were we thinking? We should have done this always because this is just amazing. Birds aren't going to sing outside your door. Uh, it's just not going to do that. But it is so worth the fight. By the time we got to the spring, so what, six, seven months in, my relationship with our oldest son, who was always strong-willed, was a thousand times better than it had ever been. I, I dared to try to understand who he was. I was content before he went to school for someone else to figure him out. I was happy to feed him. I was happy to clothe him. I was happy to throw his birthday party, but somebody else needed to deal with him, right? And some of you may feel that way. So I'm betting a lot of you are like, please, 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 no, 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 right? I want to dare you to think differently about this. Could it be, could it be that the sovereign God of the universe is extending to you an opportunity specifically for that kid to get to know that kid? Because that is certainly what happened to me. And through this whole thing, we got to know each other. I really, I had loved him because he was my son, but I hadn't liked him. Okay. Yes. I just said that. I got to where I really liked him because I got him because I was invested with him, because I was doing something that I would never have chosen to do, but I got to do. And leaning into that and the relationship and fighting for that relationship for, with him, with his siblings, has been the honor and privilege of my life. And so I really want to challenge you to put a different frame on this. I get that it's COVID. I get it. But what if what if this is a providential extension of God extending you an opportunity to get to know your kids in a way that you never would have gotten to know them and for them to get to know you and for both of you to deal with some junk that you could have indefinitely put off, but it's not good for either of you because I really think that's what this is. If marriage is sanctification, home education is sanctification on steroids <laughs> and in, in the best possible way. Right. I am not who I was when we started this 25 years ago. It's a walk ago. of faith. It is a walk of faith. But the fact that I'm not the same person is the best news for anybody who ever meets me, right? God has been so faithful and has taught me so much. And that's what I really believe he wants to do with you. He really wants to prove himself faithful and good and true. And he really wants to give you an opportunity to trust him in ways that you never would have before. Because if God, if the God of the universe who put the stars in place and spun the planets into orbit has actually sent these kids into your home, you're qualified to do this. And it may not be if your kid's into physics and you don't have the first idea even how to spell the word, I promise you, God will show you ways to meet the kids, the, the needs of that child in ways that will blow your mind. 
because that's what we've seen over and over. It's literally a walk of faith, one step at a time. Well, I like to say that God will fill in gaps so big, a school drive right through. Exactly. Okay, you see, hear it? So Rachel just said a couple things that I, I have to uh, comment on. Our first year was rocky. Our second year was much better. By the third year, we were writing educational philosophies. And by the fourth year, we were committed with the high school looming off in the distance. That's very typical. There are statistics that show that typically after the first year of homeschooling, about 20% drop out. After the second year, another 20% drop out. After the third year, 10%. And then the curve flattens out. So typically about only half of us might be left three or four years from now. So don't beat yourself up if this first year is a little tough and rocky and and you're trying to figure it out. It, it's your first year. But just make sure that you and your kids are fighting shoulder to shoulder, not nose to nose, right? You've got to make sure that you're on the same team. And when you fail, you're getting up together and you're brushing each other off and you're saying, okay, well, that didn't work. Let's figure out something else. Let's figure out a different schedule. Let's figure out a different curriculum. Right. Let's be flexible. Figure out... You can be. Yeah. And so that's what it is, right? And I think that's why so many of us love the institution, right? It seems like insta fix. This kid's driving me crazy. Put him on the bus. Bye. See you with a snack when you get home. And we love that. But this isn't that. This is going to literally be a process. It's going to be a process, but it's going to be a process that is totally worth it. Totally, totally, totally worth it. And But you're going to have to make sure that instead of fighting with your kids, you're fighting with your kids and for your kids. And so that's the opportunity that you really have. Well, and the other thing I wanted to say, a little bit of a tangent, but Rachel talked about our first year and thinking that reading would be the measure of our you know, six-year-old uh, in that first year. And he, it appeared as though he was not reading on purpose to make us look bad. Which was uh, not true. But here's what I want to set you free today if you have kids in that reading age frame. So the way I'll say this is, when do kids typically sit up? When they're six months, plus or minus a month. When do kids typically walk? When they're a year old, plus or minus three months. Some kids walk at nine months. Some take 15 months. But in that ballpark, they're going to walk. When do kids ride a bike? Four years old, plus or minus a year. Notice the range is getting bigger. So when do kids read? Now, if you're like most people, you're saying five or six years old, because that's what we've been conditioned to think. But the stats show that kids read at age eight plus or minus three years. So yes, there are some five-year-olds that read. There are also some 11, uh, some kids that read when they're 11 and it looks like they're never going to read, but they are going to read, right. if, especially if you teach them to love reading and just right. sit down and read good books with them, snuggle on the couch and spend time. So let that set you free. Yes. Let that give you a brand new paradigm of what is reality. Right. And where your child is. We had kids that read on the front end of that range. We had kids that read at the back end of that yep. range. And it was great with the, the other kids that were later not being stressed about yeah. it. And trust me, they will more than make up for any reading they didn't do by the time they do. Because then they're off and running. Exactly. Especially if you focus on that love of learning and you sit around good literature, good books. There's so many great reading lists out there for a multitude of different ages. Just choose some really good books. If you're teaching them to read, do that with books on their level. When you're reading aloud to them, which I highly encourage, always read just above them. And engage those questions and those vocabulary and plot and character, all of those glorious things of literature. And then you're inspiring them to read, right? Because... If, if you're reading and it's like, whoop, time, that's the only chapter for tonight, man, they want to read the next chapter, right? And they can do that when they can read. So it feeds itself, right? You never stop reading aloud. I was just with my last two sons that are home, so a senior and a junior, and we're adopting our read aloud list for this year. Yes. Now, it's not going to be Humpty Dumpty or little uh, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, it's probably going to be the likes of a Frankenstein book, and... Right? you know, some Charles Dickens thrown in there, some classical works, some biographies, but we're looking at our read aloud list and they're as excited as I am. So reading aloud as a family is such a rich thing to do. Build that in and fan those flames of learning and reading. So uh, we're going to start wrapping this up now. So there was that 
COVID-19 moment that got you started kicking and screaming, you found out, hey, this has actually got some merit to it. There were many positive things we experienced, good family relationships, the efficiencies of home education. And now you've gone through the summer, kind of evaluating what you're going to do this fall. You're here at the K-12 Alternative to say, yes, we, we, we want to do this, but we need to be at a conference to get affirmed, encouraged, challenged, and inspired because we want to celebrate all that's about to happen, we think, in our life. So here's what I want to, to tell you. The tidal wave of homeschooling is here, ladies and gentlemen. And if you're standing on a beach and you see a wave, and if you're a surfer, you can't make those waves. You can't create those waves. But when you identify a wave, you either ride it or you don't. And if you don't, you might be treading water, uh, drifting a sea at sea. Regretting lost that and, you missed the wave. Won. Exactly. But there's this tidal wave, this really big wave called home education that is here, folks. Pick that wave. Get on that wave. Ride it for all it's worth. Hang ten. Say cowabunga. Do it. Get excited about this. It's it's like a roller coaster ride too, where you're just twisting and turning. Where and you're getting your stomach's getting all messed up. And at the end of it, you say, "Whoa, that was great. Let's do it again." <laughs> but there's also going to be those lazy river moments where you can just sit back and bask in the sun and say, "Wow." God awesome. is good. I am so good. I still have those moments where I just thank God for his grace to hit us over the head with a two by four 25 years ago and get us starting uh, started on this adventure of a lifetime. We were reluctant. We started three or four years into it. We were committed to it. We've now graduated five from our homeschool with two very close two years from now. We'll have all seven graduated from our homeschool. So we're having this we're nearing the end of that part of the journey. And guess what? 12 years ago, we acquired Apologia Educational Ministries. And now we have lots of skin in the game as a publisher of the number one publisher in the homeschool space for creation-based science, for Bible and worldview curriculum, for online instruction. We have planners. We have a new elementary math curriculum. So we have resources. There's so many other great high quality resources out there, but apologia.com is our website. Homeschool-101.com is a place where you can get all kinds of free uh, devotionals, activities, PDFs, things that help you get in the game and stay in the game. Uh, Rachel and I have a podcast. So if you uh, listen to podcasts, go find ours. It's called Let's Talk Homeschool. Uh, we do two shows a month. We uh, everything homeschooling, so come. We'd love to have you join our audience at Let's Talk Homeschool. So, this is a wave you don't want to miss, folks. We are homeschool advocates because we've seen it work so well for our family in so many ways academically, relationally, which yeah. was one of our highest priorities, spiritually, and it's it's work, it's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But oh, the blessings, you will never regret them. Right away, folks. And moms, I you can catch me over at Facebook, Rachel Carmen. I do a series on that child. So we talk about that child and how to navigate that and the blessings of that. I want to help you look at that child differently as a gift from the hand of God. I'm also going to launch a new series next month on character qualities because I think that that is a foundational opportunity we have as we homeschool. And so I have lots of... Um, topics covered over there and resources for you. I do Q&A on Thursday afternoon. So if you have questions, you can private message me and I'm there to answer those. But we really do want to help you be successful. We want to help you take advantage of this. We want to be, we say at the podcast, for you what we didn't have when we started. So if there's anything that we can do, any questions we can answer, any way we can encourage you, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact us. All right. We're going to close in the way we typically close any show we do. We are walking by faith and enjoying the homeschooling adventure of a lifetime. Great being with you, folks. Thanks.